if you're joining our VMUG for the first time, um, we're happy to have you here. There's basically two ways in which you can follow the conversation and the presentation. Uh, you can either watch the screen sharing in Zoom, or you can join us in the Miro board as external editors and actually take part in the exercises because Malud really had uh, put together a very interesting and interactive session where you're gonna be part of the action. So we highly recommend you check out the Miro board. The link, I'm just gonna paste it one more time in the Zoom, the Zoom chat. You also have in your uh, one hour reminder email if that's easier for you. And just join us in the board because we'll be, oh wow, I need to take a photo. Yeah, of actually this, I'm just gonna take yeah, a photo this of is, this one. Maybe uh, take a screenshot and then... Oh, this is definitely a screenshot. Yeah. All right, screenshots taken, photos done, social media posts pending. Yeah, there's the, the Twitter handle at Remote Forever for those of you who want to tell the internet mm -hmm. where, you're, where you're headed. All right, folks, let's get started. Uh, for the, the ones who freshly joined, 116 people, happy to have you here. Raz here. And Anna. We're gonna be your hosts and MCs for the session. Brittany helping us uh, all the way from San Francisco. It's pretty early there. Brittany, thank you for- Oh, Texas. For I'm in Austin. Texas. Yeah, <laughs> I moved. <Perfect. laughs> oh, good to know. And Malud, our, our special guest. If Malud could just wave for everyone to see you. There we go, perfect. All right, so as I said, um, feel free to join us in the mural board. There's tons of cursors on the screen right now. So if you are in the mural board and you just I don't know, get exhausted by all the colorful, beautiful jitters uh, of those, those cursors. If you look at the top right, uh, you're gonna see your uh, pretty avatar. You can click on the hide cursor, hide collaborators cursors. It is the first icon yeah. in the top bar. Yeah, and the top right, there's this tiny cursor with two lines attached to it. If you, if you feel this is a little bit overwhelming to you, we will turn that off. All right. We're going to take over the screen now and walk you through the first bits of our session. Let us know if everything is working correctly. Here we are. Boom. So the seventh edition, can't believe we're at the seventh edition already. The seventh edition of the EMA VMUG sessions, how to become a better online facilitator with the one and only Malud Cecarelli. I hope I did not butcher your name, Malud, but I'm going to give you the virtual microphone and uh, you can uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, about what you do and uh, our session today. Hi everyone. Uh, some of you have already heard me talk. I am very comfortable being online. And no, you did not butcher my name. That's actually the correct way of pronouncing it. Although since I work with internationals, they usually do not know that the C in the beginning of an Italian term is pronounced ch. So they usually say Mulut Secarelli. Okay. Uh, I'm the founder of Remote Forever, and for many of you who know me, and I can recognize some of you guys, I am from the Agile world. So I've been an Agile coach for many years, and I was the first person who dared to say that for being Agile, you do not need to be collocated. And I created Remote Forever and Remote Forever Summit, which was the first online conference addressing specifically the topic of distributed Agile. And I've spent many years getting educated to be a good facilitator. But the majority of the content out there are about facilitating in-person meetings. And some people don't even understand what facilitation actually is. They think it's synonymous with running a meeting. So hopefully today I can tell you the difference and I can also teach you the tips and tricks for online facilitation. I was recently featured in Forbes, which I'm still in awe of, and I'm still surprised to see how much attention that article is getting. So if you haven't seen it, please go and check it out. It talks about four uh, mistakes that companies are making that is costing them thousands of dollars. And for those of you who like the session and stick with us at the, to, till the very end, we have a course launch coming up in the middle of August. And before that, we have a crash course which I have links right here on this slide that you can see a link to. There is also a free gift on that very page that you can just swipe and take it, but don't do it right now. Do it at the end. You'll have access to this board. And for those of you who stay until the very end, I'm going to give you a coupon for a discount to this crash course that you can have the courses in two weeks. You're going to love it if you want to join us. And yeah, I think that's pretty much Mulud in a nutshell with a little bit of 
promo. Thank you, Malud. Now, just a couple of housekeeping items. Rest is gonna scroll down for those of you who are joining us in the middle board, we have here a couple of actions that you might wanna take a look at. So for example, you can duplicate elements by just control D or command D. You can use the voting um, uh, feature here. And obviously we can select the blue dot near the thumbs up. We're gonna show exactly how to do that a bit later. Then we have actually the pointer versus pen depending on the type of device you are using to navigate the board. And obviously we have the undo action, which is control Z or command D, which is uh, basically the same Bang in your system, yeah. yeah. So there are just a few indicators if you're here in the board for the first time. Just uh, We're going to uh, enable the bring to me feature mm -hmm. so that you're always viewing what we're viewing. So it's easier for you to, to follow us. And now we have a very cute icebreaker for all of you. So you can see here, some of you already pinpointed the location that you're joining from. So what we would like you to do now is to select an icon that you find representative and point it in the location that you're joining us from. So, so if you're looking at some examples here, just zooming into Europe a little bit, some people already added their pianos <laughs> and kites and all the way here to- We have a bus. Africa. <laughs> so using the, the left-hand side panel, if you click on the three dots, uh, you also have the instructions on the board. You can search for an icon that you think represents you and your, your area. Perhaps we can show them. Yeah, okay, so let's, do, let's just do a we quick... Add we add ours we, as well. Yeah, let's create an, look for an icon. What should we do this time? Vampire is always the classical one, but we should try for... Okay, let's try something else. Hmm. Mm -hmm. We have cabbage. We have cabbage. Yeah, well, we have cabbage. <laughs> go for cabbage. So here we are. So drag the icon, put it in your appropriate area where you're joining us from and then using C on your keyboard just drop a comment and tell us your name and the location where you're joining us from. I've always considered this a very good exercise of actually knowing your region because the map as you can see has no lines. Yeah it's a mute map. I, I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure I put mine right. So wow so many so many icons on this map right now. Amazing. All right, hopefully everyone managed to recognize their, their area and tell us where they're from. Great job, everyone. Moving on to the next section. This is where, if, we, if you follow us, just bring everyone to me. If you look at right here, this area is where we're gonna be collecting all the questions that you have for Malut. So um, whether you wanna hop into Miro and start typing in any questions you have throughout the presentation, this is the place to do it, or if you're following us in Zoom, we're gonna keep an eye out for the uh, for, for the questions and make sure to populate them in here. So by the end of the presentation, we will review all of these questions. And now without further ado, Malud, we will stop screen sharing and head over to you. If you could screen share your, uh, your screen so we could follow you and make sure that we grab this in the recording, that will be amazing. Okay, let's see if I can do that. I actually sent you guys a private message. Please have a look and help me yeah, while do. I'm doing other things. Thank you. Absolutely. We, we got you covered. Perfect. Do you guys see my board? If you do, please give me a thumbs up. Okay. So let's get started. Those of you who are on the mirror board, I want you to follow me into this panel with the nice different weather icons. And imagine for a minute that your mood is a weather. And I want you to hover your mouse and tell me where your mood is right now. Where are you emotionally? Like you can say, oh, I feel very sunny today or I feel stormy or, oh, it's really cold and it's really white. So imagine your mood is a metaphor and just bring your mouse to the screen so we can see all the cursors. So this is a really easy way in an online workshop to see where people stand in terms of anything. I'm gonna get you a little more tips on this, but what I want to emphasize on is that today here, as you saw in the very beginning, we are a very mixed group. 
which means that it's impossible to give you exact tips and tricks that work specifically for your situation. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm going to give you a buffet of concepts and exercises and practices. And I hope that with this collaboration with you, you're gonna learn at least one thing that you can take away. If some of you have learned two things, that would send me over the roof and I would be super happy that you got two things out of this. So I will be giving you the concepts that you need for facilitation. If you thought that this is a tutorial for how to use Miro or how to use Zoom, sorry, you're in the wrong place. But if you thought that this is about the mindset and the skill set of actually facilitating workshops online and turning all those unproductive, boring meetings into engaging workshops, this is the right place for you. Without further ado, let's have a look at this concept. So I'm gonna hide your cursors now to be able to focus. Many of you are familiar with the concept of teaching. Teaching is focused on transferring knowledge and skills. If a student is able to demonstrate the learned skills, that means your teaching has been successful. Easy and straightforward, right? Coaching is a different aspect of interacting with other people. Coaching is supposed to help a person change in the way they wish. So as a coach, you do not own the agenda. It's the coachee that owns the agenda. And what happens in coaching is that you build awareness and you empower the other person to make the choice to change. Facilitation, however, is the art of creating an environment and experience through which your participants will be able to learn the concepts themselves. Do you see the difference between teaching, coaching, and facilitation? Let's show your cursors once again. And I'm going to ask you, bring your cursor to the area, to the circle, where you are struggling the most. Now let's look at the area where you find yourself most often in your meetings. Do you guys see the movement? So apparently the majority of people are struggling with facilitation and the majority of our people are actually finding themselves facilitating. Which brings me to the point of why facilitation and learning the skills and the mindset is so important. These are the guide, guiding principles of online facilitation. The guiding principles are basically the stances, uh, sorry, not the stances, but the, the different pillars that every facilitator needs to hold true at all times during a session that they're hosting. The first and the biggest one is holding the group's agenda. If you go to a session and you bring your own agenda, you're teaching. If you go to a session and you, uh, you completely dedicate and detach from the agenda, you're coaching. If you hold the group's agenda, that is you and the group, you are facilitating. The next one is honor the wisdom of the group. A facilitator's key skill is to be able to identify the different roles that people are playing at different points in time and make sure that the, uh, that the wisdom that exists in the group surfaces and it's not always the loudest person or the most dominant person or the person with the highest level of hierarchy that gets their voice across. The staying neutral is another one. It's one of the hardest skills to practice as a facilitator. Staying neutral means at some points, even though you think you know the solution and people are totally lost in their discussions, you should hold back and not bring content. A good facilitator, listen to this part very carefully. A good facilitator creates the container in which people create the content. Got it? A facilitator creates the container in which people create content. The next pillar is adjusting the container to allow for storms. What does this mean? 
it means as long as there is no conflict, as, not, as long as there is no opposing opinions, constructive conversations will not happen and good decisions will not make, be made. So a facilitator's job is to design that experience, design that container so that they can lead the people into creating those constructive conversations. And of course, the last but not the least is maintaining a growth mindset. Growth mindset comes as opposite to the scarcity mindset. Growth mindset is focused on seeing opportunities, seeing possibilities, rather than focusing on limitations and thinking that something is limited and we are only like restricted with a certain uh, amount of the topic or the thing that we're talking about. Zooming out a little bit, in facilitation, actually, you know, let me just go back a little bit and play a little game with you one more time. Let me see, like when you are facilitating, since many of you pointed out that you guys are facilitators, show me where you find yourself struggling the most in these different pillars. Just hover your cursor, move your cursor to the area, to one area that is your top struggle. Seems like staying neutral and what was that one? I totally can't see it. <laughs> it was adjusting the container to allowing for storm. It's like we're settled on staying neutral and changing the container. That seems to be the tough struggle. Now let's look at the next part. That is, hold on. All right. The triangle of different ways that a facilitator needs to be skilled in. These are different areas. And I say facilitation is hard because as a facilitator, you need to have a helicopter view and look at the room or the virtual room from above and be aware of so many different things that are going on. A great in-person facilitator is a person who can sense the energy of the room and change the exercises, change the container in order to adapt and adjust to the energy. In online facilitation, it becomes very different. As a facilitator, your job is mostly done before the session even starts because you need to prepare so much more. But let's look at what we need to be aware of and what we can actually do to prepare and to create that kind of container that allows us to stay neutral, but also guide the conversation going forward. So this part is a little bit of theory, but I think that this theory can actually be super helpful, especially for those of you who have never been trained in facilitation. Before I get to that though, I wanna tell you this. Every conversation, whether it's in person or online, every conversation that happens diverges and converges. So in the beginning, people have several different ideas that they might have questions, they might have wonderings, and that some things might be puzzling to them, but whatever happens, through the way we communicate with each other, the conversation diverges and converges. We get to some idea and then we diverge and we converge again until we have a better idea and then we diverge and converge again. So what happens is that this, the, this method of diverging and converging keeps repeating itself until we have a decision. What happens in reality, however, when we're doing bad facilitation or when there is no facilitation at all in meetings, you probably notice that many, many meetings end up with no decision and we'll have to repeat that same meeting, we have to repeat that same conversation and we get stuck in not being able to make a decision. Now I want you, to, those of you who are in Zoom, type in the chat box and let me know if you have experienced this repeated conversations that happen where you don't know how to get unstuck. Just type yes in the chat box. Amazing. So many of you have actually seen this getting stuck thing. So I hope that the next bit is going to be exciting for you guys, especially those of you who are saying yes. Uh, all right, oh, let's go here. What I'm going to introduce you to you is the Kenter four-player model. 
So let's look at this. Cantor is a person who has studied social sciences and psychology and behavioral sciences, and he has come up with this model. It has nothing to do with facilitation, but I think it's an amazing model that can help us become better facilitators. It talks about how in verbal conversations, when we're talking, I'm, I, and I'm telling you like the difference between verbal and tactile and visual in, in a bit, but I'm focusing on verbal right now. Cantor says that we, as human beings, we take either, uh, like we make all these moves. We either move or follow or oppose or bystand. Let's look at what each one of them actually is. When a person moves, that means they initiate or give direction. The language of move is let's move on or let's hear from someone else or I wanna stay on this topic or come on, let's vote, let's take action. Have you heard this? You probably have. So the move is something that each one of you can do, every person in the meeting can do, but it's only one of the four actions that a person does. There is also follow. So a person who follows, supports, or draws to conclusion. There is somebody who moves, somebody who follows. They might exchange places just in the next 10 seconds, but this is how it is at every certain point in time. The language of follow is, tell me more about that. What would that look like? Oh yeah, I agree. Or what's important about this? The next stance or the next player move in the Kenter model is a pose. A pose is challenging or suggesting corrections. The language of it is no, or I don't agree because that information and you're just revealing information that the group doesn't have. And it does not have to be adversarial. It can be very kind and gentle, but it is offering a counterpoint, which is why we call it a pose. The other per, uh, part of like the other way of observing this in, in terms of language is I would rather not do that because, and then you just reveal a certain information that the group doesn't have. So what I'm saying is that the, as a facilitator, you need to be aware of where people are or what move they are taking. And by practicing this, you actually become really good at observing that was a move, that was a follow, that was a bystand, that was an oppose. And you'll be able to unstuck conversations with the right questions and with the right moves. The last one is bystand. A bystander reveals or offers perspective. The language of that is, I'm noticing that, or it seems to me that, or I'm feeling that, or what I see is, and you offer the perspective. Got it? So let's actually see, hmm, let me see. I'm gonna just like leave you with this little bit of theory because we're gonna have a lot more to talk about it. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how conversations end up being stuck with different combinations of this player moves. So uh, sometimes people only take moves. Like one person moves, the other moves, the other moves, the other moves, there is no correlation, there is no follow. And it, it's just like a bunch of initiatives that are presented and there is no, no way to get unstuck. And that's where a conversation gets stuck and you have to repeat the same meeting over and over and over again. The other pattern for getting stuck is compliance, where one person moves and everybody else follows. That same person moves and everybody else follows. This happens a lot in cultures where there is hierarchy and where it's not okay to oppose what the other person with a higher rank or a deeper experience is saying. It's not culturally accepted to oppose or bystand. But again, conversations get stuck if this pattern keeps repeating itself. The other pattern is a pattern of right and wrong, which is one person moves, the other one opposes. That person moves, another one opposes. Again, there is no follow and there is no bystand, which means the conversation is stuck. As a facilitator, it's your job to be able to identify these different stuck patterns and do something about it. The next one is hidden opposition, where one person moves and one person kind of follows, but with a hidden agenda to oppose. Or they bystand with a hidden agenda to oppose. Again, this is a little trickier, but if you practice this and if you practice observing this, you'll see that you can actually identify it and do something about it. 
Now, if we were a smaller group, like I was promised in the beginning that we're going to be like 20, 30 people, I would break you up into smaller groups and have you discuss this and have, have an actual exercise for you. But unfortunately, or fortunately, because we are so many people, that would be impossible to actually practice it. Although we do say that, we do teach different ways of getting conversations unstuck in our course. So if you want to learn deeply and really practice it in the spot, you can join the course and see that in practice. But now we're going to do another exercise that's more suitable for B groups. And Raz and Anna, can I just have, you know, like make sure that these are votable so yes. we can actually vote? All right, perfect. So what I want you guys to do is to place a vote using this super awesome feature in Miro. Can you tell people how they vote, Raz? Absolutely. In one second. One vote. question, Malud. Uh, sh how much time do we need for the voting session and how many votes per person? One vote per person and okay. just like one minute. Perfect. Okay. All right, everyone. So what's going to happen now? So if you're in the Miro board, I'm just going to start a voting session. We've already set it up and set the boundaries of what areas and parts are votable. So uh, follow Malud's instruction and place your vote on one of the four items that you feel uh, you experience most in your team. Everyone ready? All 100 people. I'm going to start the voting session with one minute and one vote per person now. So everyone should see the mural board should focus you on a specific area and just place your vote on one of the four gray boxes or the elements inside them in order to place your vote. So the question is, in online discussions, groups often fall into conversation patterns that get them stuck. Which of these do you experience the most in your team? If you have trouble coming up with one, just think about the last meeting you've had versus the conversation was stuck and try to identify which one of these patterns you saw. We have under 30 seconds. Wow. <laughs> so many colors. So folks, you have 14 seconds to go into the mural board and place your votes. Okay, so we ended the voting session. It's processing the results right now. So um, the results are as follows. I'm just gonna tell you because I see the results. Uh, the winner is compliance by double the number of votes from contender number two. So compliance seems to be the, the most common experience. And then the second uh, place goes to right and wrong. Mm. And third place to move only. Interesting. So the, uh, Interesting. The out output of the voting session. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rez and Anna, for helping me do this part. So what you guys see here is the first step to great facilitation, which is observing. The next step would be setting intention. And then after that would be confronting and doing something to fix it. But again, as I told you, because there's so many people, it would be very hard to tell you how that's done. I will tell you one thing though. When you're in verbal conversations, a really easy way to get things unstuck, to get conversations unstuck, is to play around with the group sizes. And this is just one of the many things you can do. So if, you, if your group, and I just have like put five people here, but it could be many more or even less than that. When people are isolated in their thinking, if it's move, 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 or move and then everybody follows, which means that people are keeping their ideas to themselves and they're not merging their ideas to shape something bigger and better than themselves. So one of the things you can do is to divide the group into smaller, uh, smaller sizes. Like you can start with having conversations in pairs, which allows people to have a more uh, comfortable environment, to have a safer space, and to be able to merge their ideas together. You can also group them in groups of three and do the same thing. Or in groups of three, something very interesting that you can do is to have two people talk to each other and try to merge their ideas and the third person to be completely quiet and just observe. And at the end, offer perspective or offer feedback and then switch these roles, like rotate this role of the third person until the three can actually merge their ideas. And only then you should bring all these people who have had so many different small conversations together and have them present 
so that you can create the structures that can guide them to bring all their ideas together and finally into a decision. So if you find conversations that are stuck as a facilitator, you need to create the structure, you need to create the environment and the experience that can allow people to get unstuck. And this is like the super easy way of thinking about it. Think about the group sizes and you already have a very practical tip for how to do this. Let's see. So from there, we go to talking about, so we've been talking about verbal and I'm gonna close the verbal so that I can also talk, talk to you a little bit about the visual and tactile ways of facilitating online. So in visual and tactile, I'm gonna talk to you about actions and structures. We're gonna start with structures. As I said, a facilitator's main job that is done before the session is to create structures with which they can guide the people. They can guide the conversations. There are very simple structures like this one that you're all familiar with, you know, simple columns, next and online, what is being done, what is being discussed right now, and what is done. And keeping that visual so that everybody knows what is going on. Even a timer combined with that would help. But a tricky way of doing that or a smart way of doing that in a facilitated way is to design that columns in a funnel shape so that you can guide the conversations going forward to be bringing the, the, the divergence of ideas to be selected, to allowing the group to select because you're giving them less space. In a physical environment, you can literally like draw a circle on the floor and have people put stuff in that container. In online, you also do the same thing. You design the size, you design the space with which people can actually interact. And through that, you guide the conversation. You guide the discussions that are happening. Another very interesting structure that I kind of like is what's in Agile, a lot of people here are from the Agile world, so you are probably familiar with this. It's using metaphors to guide the conversation. This metaphor that you see here is the metaphor of a sailboat. So a team assumes that they're on the sailboat and they're gonna talk about where they're going, which defines their goal and vision, and what is helping them in the organization to move towards that goal. That is the win. And you know, they put ideas that are helping them or stuff that they observe. And what is the anchor? The things that they're in control of, but those are obstacles, that those are the slowing them down and also risks that are rocks at the bottom of the lake where we know they're there, but we are not exactly aware how they're gonna impact us in the future. And through this metaphor, a facilitator can actually uh, extract a lot of really interesting ideas from the group. And by designing the structure after this initial ideation, you can help the group come to actual actions and decisions going forward. And uh, let's see what else do I have here. I actually have another simple structure. So structures don't have to be so complicated. They can be like as simple as a line. And this is an example of how you can use the line. So we are a very large group, right? If we were smaller, I would probably use more complex uh, structures. But because we're a large group, I have to stick to very, very simple structures and very simple actions. So I'm gonna give you an interaction right here. So please just take one of these bubbles and put it on the line where it describes how long you've been working, whether it's less than three months, three to four months, or one year or more. And let's look at the cursors again so you can see the fun as it's happening. Wow. Screenshot. <laughs> So while you guys are posting, I'm gonna just come back to that. I'm gonna give you yet another structure that you can use, which is a very simple four square model that you're all familiar with. It could also be a three circle thing. Simple models where you can ask people to place their ideas there. Like on this one, I could say, hey guys, point to me, like which is your favorite uh, fruit? And that would be the fruits that we're gonna buy for our party or whatever. So it can be different things. But let's go back to the voting and see how we are doing. 
So it seems like the majority of the people have started working remotely since the lockdowns started in the world. Very awesome and very interesting. I hope that many of you will become remote forever, especially after the session that you learn how to do those things. All right, I'm gonna just move on. So we talked about visual tactile in terms of the structures, how a facilitator needs to create structures. Now I wanna to talk to you about the different actions that you have. If you remember, in the beginning I said, I'm gonna give you a buffet of concepts and actions and tactics. This one, actions, is literally a whole buffet of different actions you can take on the visual structures that you create with the observations that you're gonna have on the verbal uh, challenges and the verbal moves that people make. Let's just start with the different actions that are possible. You can simply ask people to draw and they do not need to have an online whiteboard. Although if they do, you can actually see how horrible people are in drawing online like I did here. You can even just use a simple notebook and pen, have people draw and show it to you or share a picture of it and share it with you. Another simple exercise that you can do or an action that you can do is to ask people to hover over. You see that hovering over a digital whiteboard is a really great tip for large groups. As you see, I, I keep doing this. I keep asking you to hover your mouse over a certain area where it represents your idea or your stance or your X, right? Different is grouping. You can have a backlog of items, a bucket of items and create a structure and ask people to just pick from the bucket, pick from the backlog and put it in the right group. And you can get super creative in what shapes and forms the groups can take. Another exercise or action is sorting. You can have simple cards, simple ideas, simple development items, design items, backlog items. And you should ask, you can ask people to sort them based on a certain criteria, like how much money do you think we are gonna make with developing this feature? Or how difficult is it to develop this feature? Or which one of these has the biggest dependency level or whatever. So I'm talking software because that's my background, but I hope that you can also find out how sorting can be useful for you guys. And something that is overlooked oh so tremendously is reactions with emojis. Nowadays, practically everyone who works remotely has access to a chat tool. You do have access to a chat tool, right? If you do, type yes in the chat box. Okay, great. So I'm not totally off. You do have access to a chat box. One thing that we don't do it as often is to use these beautiful emojis. I know that emojis have started becoming very popular with the millennials and the generation after that, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of people use them because I know my dad uses it and my grandmother uses it. So I know that you guys know what they mean. What, as a facilitator, what you can do with reactions and emojis is if you don't have access to a whiteboard or if you want to do something very, very quickly, like a very quick voting in your chat tool, you can use reactions. Like one of the teams that I have, we often have ad hoc meetings and we wanna, want, we wanna like make a quick decision. So what I do as a facilitator is I go to the chat group, to the group chat, and I say, those of you who would like to have the meeting at 11 a.m., please react to this message with an apple. And those of you who wanna have it at 2 p.m., react with a strawberry. And that's it. The voting is super quick and super easy. And it is called facilitation using emojis. The facilitation does not need to be super fancy. It's about facilitating conversations and helping people to make better decisions. You can also ask people to share gifts, memes, songs. I do this all the time when I'm working remotely with people because conversations are not always happening in meetings. There is so much conversation that goes on when we're off meeting and we're working in our daily, daily work and we're communicating over chat. So you can always say, hey guys, what did you think about that feature that we just released? Or what did you think about the customer reactions that we got? Or, you know, share a gift that, that describes your weekend. That, that also works with creating a positive culture in your chat, in your written conversations. And of course, an easy one is show stuff to the camera. The other day, someone was asking me, Mulud, how can we do, uh, how can we have uh, Scrum Poker? Was it called Scrum Poker? Gosh, I, I'm forgetting the name. What was, in the, what was the word actually? Help me out. The, the poker thing. Thank you. Planning poker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It just escaped my mind for a second. 
So someone asked me like, how can we play planning poker when we're remote? And I thought, well, the easiest way I can think about it is download a planning poker app because there is a million of them and just show your vote to the camera. Voila, done. Of course, there are other tools that can help you. But this is a very easy technique. Use it. When people are on camera, use it. And if you have people who choose not to be on camera, always give them options. Say, those of you who are on camera, show me with your fingers or show me on a paper or show me on your phone. And those of you who are in chat, type in the chat box. It's really easy to do this as long as we know what options we have available. Another option like Zoom has is polls or surveys. If you don't have a video camera tool in your organization that allows this functionality, you can always use a, a third uh, party tool or you can use emojis in chat. That always works for polling. If you give people options, like, you know, option one, apple, option two, strawberry, option three, banana, option four, you know, I'm just using fruits because it's easy and simple. You can also just use numbers. And that's a very easy way of polling, especially if your group is small. And this one, which I hope that the engineers out there love it, it's allowing people or helping people to communicate through sketching, flowcharting, or even coding. And I know that engineers love to draw flowcharts. So if they don't like to draw this way, you can help them to draw this way. So this is a buffet of actions that you can have in how you can facilitate visually and tactile. And I, when I talk about verbal or tactile, I'm talking about the behaviors of the group, not the facilitator. The facilitator is always talking. The facilitator is always doing something with their hands or, or with the mouse. So it's about the behaviors that the group has. Like if it's verbal, the group is talking. If it's tactile, the group is touching. And with that, we're gonna close the uh, verbal tactile and we're gonna go to nonverbal and non-tactile. And what the hell do I mean by that? Nonverbal and non-tactile is all about what needs to be done to set expectations. Agreements are extremely important. People say, let me just do this so you can actually see me. So a lot of people, they come to me and say, oh, remote working sucks. I hate working remotely. I hate online facilitation. Why? Because you can't read people's nonverbal cues. You lose all of that when you go online. You cannot read people's body language. You cannot see their facial reactions. I get that, which is why I'm giving you not only the verbal facilitation tips and tricks, but also the tactile ones. But the most important one is how can we capture the nonverbal and the non-tactile? And it all comes down to creating explicit agreements creating explicit agreements long before the meeting starts and continuing that into the meeting. One of my favorite ways for creating explicit agreements is using core protocols. Core protocols, you can Google it and there's a lot of material on it. It's under a Creative Commons license, so you can easily find it. The most common ones are pass, check-in, and check-out. And I wanna emphasize on the check-in and check-out. You do remember that in the very beginning of the session, Roz and Anna asked you to place, your, place an icon on the part of the mat to bring you mentally in the room, to check you in to the meeting. One of the things that I did was to bring you emotionally also into the meeting by asking you to hover your mouse over the weather that was describing your mood. The same is true for checking out. You need to have an explicit agreement for when people are checking out. In an online meeting, you can say, guys, this meeting is going to be only 90 minutes. In these 90 minutes, we would like everybody to be on camera. If you cannot be on camera, we're gonna assume that you're not checked in. That also means if I want to check out, this is how I'll do it. I'll turn off my camera. And everybody knows that if I'm not on camera, I am checked out. I'm probably checking my email or fetching some water or even coding because I'm a developer too. What is super important though, is to have those agreements beforehand and express them at the, at the very beginning of the meeting and every meeting, because you want to turn every unproductive meeting into an engaging workshop, all right? 
How do we do that? There are simple ways to do that. Just talk about core protocols and make sure that you have explicit agreements for how we check in and how we check out. And the rest of it is auxiliary, <laughs> like you can use it or not, but those two are super important. As a facilitator, while you're observing these different verbal behaviors and visual behaviors, and you have details and structures, there are ways you can actually help people to remember the protocols that we have set. For example, you can ask people to chat or to type in the chat. I keep doing that, and this is specifically important for larger groups. You can ask people to type something in the chat if something. You can also ask closed questions. If your group is a small, you should always ask open questions unless you want to diverge the conversation. If you want to help people narrow it down, you ask closed questions. Closed questions look like yes or no, like the part where I said, do we reopen the voting or do we move on? Yes for voting, for opening the voting and no for not opening the voting. You give people clear instructions and clear and easy ways to communicate with you, the facilitator, and also with each other in the chat. You can give them options. I've given you so many examples of options. You can also give people scales. Like you saw one example of a linear scale and one example of a different, like in the actions where I was talking about grouping, there was a circle, like inter, interconnected circles, and there was also a scale, like where you could put stuff in a two-dimensional scale. Give me a minute, I need water. When you do have expectations in place already before the meeting, which are repeated right at the beginning of the meeting, you can more easily read the energy of the group and adjust the structure and the actions that you're choosing. You can have a backlog of structures. You can say, okay, if this happens, I'm gonna use this structure, but if that happens, I'm gonna use that structure. You have it in the back of your mind because you're a great facilitator. And through that, with the agreements, you can actually read if people are responding or if they're not responding. Like when you guys were here on this exercise, I turned on the cursors. And what I saw was that people were not able to drag the bubbles because they were seeing so many cursors. So I turned it off. That was like me using the structures that I had set and changing it and adapting it. And with that, I wanna tell you a very interesting concept that can help you create a powerful explicit agreement and start into the session. This is called the power start. So before every session, before every single meeting that you have, what you're gonna do is that you're gonna think about the purpose of the meeting. You're gonna have to sit, sit down or maybe like ask questions from the stakeholders of the meeting and come up with answers to this and write them down. You're gonna ask yourself, what is the purpose of this meeting? And what is the outcome of this meeting? Outcome is usually a tangible artifact that you're gonna take away with you. You're gonna also think about who is going to be in the meeting. I'm talking about the last bit here, roles that are going to exist in the meeting. And you're gonna think about what's in it for them, for every single one of those people. You're inviting a designer, an agile coach, uh, the marketing person, maybe the CTO. And you want to bring all of these people together to work on, towards a certain purpose. What is the outcome? Maybe you're using a mirror board, maybe you're using Google Docs, maybe you're using a different artifact, but there should always be an artifact that people work towards. If you're using Jira and you're planning, that could be it make sure that everybody knows and that you actually pronounce what is that artifact that people are going to use. And then think about what's in it for every single individual that you're inviting. What's in it for the marketing person to be in that meeting? What's in it for the CTO to be in that meeting? What's in it for the designer to be in that meeting? And then because you're a great facilitator, you're going to tell them how they're going to engage. What we did in this session was that we said, Engagement is going to be on Malou's instructions, but also there is a space on this board where you can place your questions. So questions will be taken afterwards. And to give you a cheat sheet, I can tell you that I actually did this exercise before the session. So if you remember at the very beginning, I read through this. It said, we're here to introduce you to powerful and effective online facilitation concepts. We'll use a mirror board on which you will interact. 
you already know how to start a comp video conference call or a digital whiteboard. In this session, you will learn how to take your online facilitation game to the next level. I will ask you to interact with me using various visual actions and questions will be answered at the end and Roz will be reading them. Well, Roz and Anna in this case. Malud is the facilitator and the teacher and Roz and Anna would read the questions and you are the participant. I did say that, right? Now, with that, I want to leave you with a homework and the homework is right here. I want you to think about one meeting Maybe something that you repeat or maybe something that's upcoming that you are struggling with and you don't exactly know how to facilitate it. I want you to pick a column, write your name, name, name the name of the meeting, and then spend a few minutes on your own after the session and think about the purpose, the outcome, what's in it for the individuals that are there, how are they going to engage, and what roles are, they, are, are going to be in that meeting. So with that, I'm going to end the presentation so that we have some time for Q&A. You can do this exercise afterwards. You have access to this and you can complete it. And I'll be looking forward to your answers on this. But as I said in the end, it will be something like this. You can read it at the very beginning of the meeting and create engagement right away and create agreements right away so that people would verbally and visually engage with the structures that you designed for them. Thank you very much for listening and for playing along with me. And yeah, as I said, like this, this is just an introduction to a course that we have. We have two versions, a crash course and a longer 10 week course. If you're interested, click on the link that's in my slide on top of the board next to my picture and you'll be able to get it. And uh, thank you guys. Amazing. Thank you, Malut, Fantastic so much. Presentation. It was really nice following. I mean, we, we've seen it. We, we've seen all this before, but kind of seeing the whole delivery and, and the, the presentation, amazing. Thank you so, so much, folks. Please stick around for Q&A. Uh, I don't want people thinking this is the absolute end. Like, we're just going to have a short term. We obviously have a few questions uh, already, already placed by you folks, and uh, we're just going to go through them one by one. Malut, most of them are for you, but there are some items that we could help you out here and there. So a lot of thank yous. People seem to be really excited with the presentation. They should be because it was stellar. All right, let's, thank you let's, kick, off. Thank you. let's kick off with the questions. Uh, folks, if you still have questions, ideally just pop them into the Miro board where we have the dedicated section, the start a conversation early, the, the pinkish reddish section, or if you want, you can, paste you them can in just the chat. paste them in the chat, but let's go through them one by one. And uh, I'm not going to screen share. I'm just going to read them, read through them. So, We'll see it. So many questions. This is amazing. Very long one. Let's see. When facilitating online, it seems hard to uphold a facilitator presence. Example, someone who should be looked at as a lead, as leading the work happening, controlling the conversation. It seems that the facilitator loses their presence when not in the room physically with participants. How would you recommend an online facilitator boost their presence in a workshop? Malud, if you could uh, take this one through the structures that you create and through choosing the right action at the right time, as well as what I shared in the nonverbal, which is checking in very often. I don't know if you guys noticed, but in this workshop, I did not speak without interacting with you for longer than eight minutes. Every eight minutes, you guys have to do something. And if the group was smaller, it would be even more the participants will have to do a lot more. And I designed the structures so that the participants are engaged. And mm -hmm. when you create the structures in the right way, you allow people to bring the content. Remember when I said, listen carefully. I, said, I literally said it like this. The facilitator is the person who creates the container in which people create the content. If you are not able to allow people to create content, that means you have things to learn and you have things to practice in your online facilitation game. Awesome. Thank you, Milu. Hopefully the person who asked this got their, their answer. Next one. Um, how can I use it for teaching classes? All right. Super interesting. I think everything that, that Malud talked about and uh, Malud, I'm going to take this one because it kind of connects with something that we're, we're also going to be doing in our next VMUG. So how can I use it for teaching classes? Um, everything that Malud talked about still applies no matter what type of workshop or activity you're running.
because we're doing a lot of workshops and very specific workshops for like design and strategy and, and product. And um, we basically found that everything that Malu talked about here is, is kind of uh, in, englobed in the whole like facilitation skill set. So it allows you to, to take these learnings and like verbal, nonverbal, and, and all of the, the logic and the frameworks that Malu presented can apply to different kinds of, of I don't know, activities, not just workshops where you co-create. It also applies to teaching. And later this month, we're gonna have the eighth edition of the EMA VMUG. Where we're gonna have two very talented trainers, agile trainers, they're gonna tell us exactly how to, to conduct like uh, trainings and teaching sessions digitally using Miro. So for, for the person who asked this, definitely keep an eye out. You're gonna get an email if you've signed up for this VMUG, you're gonna get announced about the, the second one. So uh, that's gonna be specifically for teaching in, in a remote environment. So make sure to, to check that out. If you wanna add anything else, Malou, to this specific question for like teaching classes, any specific advice or, or tips and tricks that, that you've seen work? I think that the two Agile coaches who will be here will probably tell you this. When you're teaching, you're holding the content. I told you in the beginning the difference between teaching, coaching, and facilitation. The teacher has the content, but also needs to create the container. A facilitator only has the container. The people have the content. When you're teaching online, make sure that you have another person with you. Always do it in, in, in a pair so that when you're delivering content, someone else can hold the container. Like I did this here mostly alone and it's very, very hard. It was easier because it was a larger group and I kind of designed it for large group engagement and also delivered it like a webinar. If it were mostly an interactive workshop where we needed to make a decision, all of us together, it would not be as easy. So what I would recommend is for smaller groups, always have another person to help you and you can switch. Like I actually see a coworker of mine, a previous coworker of mine here with whom I have delivered many classes and we were always taking turns. It was either me facilitating and she teaching or the other way around. Awesome, amazing. It's Thank you, Malud. Really, really spot on as Jennifer mentioned. All right, next one, this is for us. What's a VMUG? All right, so really great question. Thank you for, for doing that. So a VMUG stands for Virtual Miro User Groups. And right now you're in the EMA area and the EMA version of the VMUG. Uh, what we're aiming to do with these VMUG is to, VMUGs is to find people and put them in the spotlight. And we're looking for people that are experts in the field of remote collaboration, future of work, uh, any type, anything that involves like digital co-creation sessions or, or teaching or trainings that is done vir virtually via Miro. So if you've seen the previous ver uh, uh, episodes of, of the VMUG, we've had people talking about how to uh, create learning experiences in Miro, how to do design sprints. That's something that we personally do. So we're trying to find all of these talented people that exist out there that use Miro on a regular basis and that uh, are super, like, they, they just, take it to the next level and just do amazing things with it. So if everyone here is interested and, and you have something to share with the community, make sure to reach out to us and we could organize a VMUG that features you and your work. So that would be a, a VMUG in a nutshell. All right, how next to, question. How to use the bring to me feature? Actually, we can oh, share okay. our screen. How to use the bring to me feature. Okay, let, let, yeah. let's do that real quick. Let, let me just share the screen. So everyone can hopefully can see my, my Miro environment. Now, the, the Bring to Me feature is really helpful for, for example, if uh, Malud wanted to get everyone's attention into one single place. I can see that right now I'm moving around, I'm zooming in and out, but I obviously want all of these cursors, everyone that is in the board to look at the same thing I'm looking at. I just look at this question board and here right at the top, you can see the Just Mad logo. This mm -hmm. is us, this is our account. I just click on my avatar and just say, bring everyone to me. And you'll notice how all the cursors are gonna focus in this area. Look at this, bring everyone to me. Now, everyone is basically, everyone who is in Miro and actually opened up the board is seeing the exact thing I'm seeing. So am I zooming in? They're also seeing the same view, right? One thing And to notice how mind. I kind of zoom into yeah. one place, they all kind of collect. One thing to keep in mind, as soon as you start scrolling away, 
uh, basically the part of the feature goes away. Exactly. So, so yeah, if, if any of you right now, you would just click and drag old. somewhere else, you're no longer going to be following us. Exactly. And vice versa, if you go, you can see like there's like 99 people here. You see a list of, every, of all the people. If I go in and I click on, on, on Emma, sorry, Emma, for targeting you. If I, if I click on, on anyone, Benny. I could just go ahead and see what uh, Benny is seeing, right? So you can always follow and, and track where, every, where anyone else is by clicking on their cursors. I see that people are already kind of using the bring to me feature quite, quite much. All right. So this is how you use the, the bring to me feature. Hopefully that was, uh, that was helpful. Let's do something of, um, yeah. Uh, okay. Any tips on bringing everyone back to focus if the conversation has been derailed? This is excellent. You, you just showed it. Are you talking about verbal conversations? Um, good question. So if the person who wrote this can tell us a little bit more, more about what he, what they meant. I can assume that you mean verbal. So the conversation is diverging and you want to converge it. I gave you a bunch of different tools that you can use. If you have not created a structure that is visual for people to place the stuff in different places, it's very easy to fall into that trap of conversation going in all sorts of directions. So when, when you notice that, the easiest way to, to fix this is to create some sort of simple structure to allow people to group their ideas or to source their ideas or to make sure that the ideas are understood in the same way. So use visual immediately or one tip that I gave you in verbal, which I didn't go deeper into, was to break up the conversation into smaller groups so that people can actually get to the bottom of it, get to the bottom of the conversation and then bring them back. So when you notice that the conversation is diverging, it has fallen in one of the patterns that I told you about in the Cantor for play model. It's either move, 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 or move and follow, or you know, opposing, like move, oppose, move, oppose. Remember those? Like you need to observe which of those patterns it is. And then for each pattern, there are actual steps that you can take to unstuck the conversation. Easier tips when you don't know those actions is use a different structure that is not currently at play. All right, uh, it seems like someone messed up our boards a little bit, but no worries, we can, Continue we're gonna survive, questions. we're gonna survive this. All right, next question, let's just pick a random one. In your opinion, can a meeting be over facilitated? Ooh. Yes, it can definitely be over facilitated. And what, what that means is controlled. Mm -hmm. A facilitation, Facilitation is the art of creating the balance between controlling and letting go, controlling and letting go. And many of us fall into the trap of teaching instead of facilitating or facilitating instead of teaching, which makes us closer to coaching, which means we don't hold the container. We don't hold the agenda. We let it go. Or we're teaching, which is like we're in full control of the content and the container. So creating that balance is an art. That's why we call it the art of facilitation. It's, it's not easy. But I, I actually can tell you a quick story that I learned from Leslie Stein or Leslie Riley right now, since she got married a few years ago. She tells us a story about how she had to practice letting go in order to unstuck a conversation that was happening. I love that story of hers. She talks about how she was in a room with a group of executives and they, were, they kept falling into this stuck patterns. And whatever she did, she couldn't get them unstuck. They needed an icebreaker. They needed a check-in that would uh, extract the energy that would change and shift the energy in the room. So this is about in-person facilitation, not online, but I think it applies in, in terms of principle. So what she does is that she goes back to her hotel room and she takes the costume that she has prepared for the Halloween party that's coming up, which is Wonder Woman. And she wears it under her clothes and she goes into this classroom or hotel conference room with these executives and as she's talking she starts taking off her clothes <laughs> and slowly like everybody's wondering like what is happening you see like creating that sense of curiosity like and something that's so unorthodox and so unconventional that's the kind of boldness that a facilitator needs to do in terms of letting go 
So at the end, she's in Wonder Woman clothes and she just stands up there and this completely changes the energy of the room. It opens a whole different level of connection and conversation. In online, you also need to let go. You see some things that happened to me and I kind of like created a balance between control and letting go. When people were moving things around on the, can on the counter model, and Raz and Anna helped me like put them back, but they were in the wrong order. Like I could get freaked out and be like, oh my God, I need to control this. Like this is totally messed up. But as we were helping it, I kept going and I trusted that you understand that we're all responsible adults. That's the assumption. Assuming that everybody who is interacting with you in a professional environment is a professional, a smart adult. And that would help you create that balance between controlling and letting go. Great point there, Mo. Thank you. Okay, let's go to so many questions. Um, so, hi, Mark here. What other ways of check in, check out would you recommend if video is not available? Bandwidth is an issue for people working from home. Or they just refuse yeah. to share the video. Follow me. On a daily basis, I work with people who are all working remotely and many of them do not feel comfortable being on camera. So one of the easy ways that we have for checking in is that everyone tells other people good morning when they start working, regardless of what time zone they're in. That indicates that they are checked in, that they are at their computer and they're working. And they want, if they want to step away, they change the status on their avatar in the chat, or they say, I'm taking a longer break. So if they're walking away for like more than 10 minutes, they always tell people in the chat. And when they're checking out for the day, they literally write down in, in the group chat and they say, I'm checking out for the day. Mm -hmm. In in-person conversations, in real-time conversations like this, when people are checked in, they actually keep interacting in the chat box. And if they're checked out, that becomes explicit. Like when I said, in the beginning, you need to set these expectations. Like if I go there as a facilitator and I say, okay, so we have some people on camera, but most people off camera, how can we check in and check out? So I'm gonna assume that we're all checked in if you're actually connected to the meeting. If you're gonna walk away from your screen and you're not gonna be able to see this screen, please type in the chat box that you're checking out. That's a very easy way to say it, right? And it's also in line with assuming people are adults and they're responsible. <laughs> so if you agree on that, everybody is going to follow it through. And if they're not agreeing, they should say so. Awesome. Thank you, Malud. Uh, we're gonna take two questions and give you a little uh, break to you can get a sip of water. Perfect. Next one, can 25 anonymous editors be all on video chat so I won't need Zoom? I think this also connects with the other one underneath that would you normally use the internal video chat in Miro or prefer Zoom as it's tried and tested? Um, personally, we can speak from our experience. Um, we've, we've used both. Um, just for this session, for example, we wanted to use Zoom because we wanted to record the session. So this is something that we really wanted to do. So uh, it highly depends on you. Uh, the, the chat features, the video chat features in Miro work just great. You could have 25 people just joining and having a conversation without any problems. Okay, let's see some other interesting questions. How to handle a person that takes over a meeting with opinions about everything? Ooh. Good See, that's one. an easy one. That's a super easy one, guys. Like <laughs> it's the easiest scenario to solve for an experienced facilitator. Mm -hmm. You design a structures and actions that are absolutely silent. Mm -hmm. You create visuals in which people have to communicate without talking, like placing things in places, moving things around, hovering the mouse over. It's actually super easy to create that. And if you need verbal, have verbal conversations in small groups. You do not even need to bring people back in the big group if you think that that person is going to destroy the entire conversation or all the decisions that have been made. You can have that last bit visually. The decisions can be put on some sort of structure and prioritized on some sort of structure. Always use the structures and actions to organize and to help get unstuck. This pattern that you talked about was the move and follow. It was the pattern of compliance when a person dominates the conversation. Mm -hmm. 
maybe we can take one more yeah um probably which one any recommendations on how long the one Uh, in the corner um yeah that's nice so do we have any recommendations on how long to go before taking a comfort break personally from our experience we never have sessions more than or longer than one hour we always take a five or 15 minutes break depending on the whole session that we have in mind for the day but it depends. We can also have like, maybe if, if we're really in the zone, we can mm-hmm. have like a one hour and 30 minute tops, right? That, that yeah. can also be doable. Malud, from your perspective, how long yeah, should Yeah, I this... also say 45 minutes max mm-hmm. because sure. we need to stretch, we need to move away and also tell people to not spend their break on checking emails, but actually yeah. move their body and move away from their computer. Amazing. All right. One more question. There's, there's still a few of them that were an, weren't answered, but we're trying to find someone, one of them that is really interesting. Um, okay. So what methods would you suggest for people who are inexperienced with the software you're using during facilitation? It can be quite disruptive if they're trying to figure it out while the session is running. Malud, if you're good. Enlighten the training session beforehand. Exactly. The majority of the work of a facilitator in an online world has to be done before the meeting. You create all the structures before the meeting. You deliver all the training before the meeting. If you're including the learning curve for a new tool in the meeting, have a longer meeting and take a break in between. It's impossible to teach people something new and have a productive conversation. Whatever moves has our attention. If it's possible to click and move things around, that's what your guys are gonna do. I forgot to lock some things and see what happens. You move things around because we're curious. We're just human. We want to see things differently and we wanna practice and learn. So do it beforehand. Raz has done a great job. Like you guys sent out the, the mirror board long before and there was instructions for different kinds. And you also repeated the instructions, the simple part anyway, in the beginning, you gave people enough time and space to move around, to play around with the icons, to place it there, to copy it, and different things that you did. You can also have that for every tool. Have a practice session before you start. Exactly. Really well pointed out. That's exactly what we do whenever we do a workshop. We have a 30-minute Miro kind of crash course. So people don't get freaked out by all these sticky notes and all those cursors. It's always a a good practice to do that. Thank you. We also try to comfort them if yeah. they do mistakes yeah i mean make them like where we're mm-hmm. comfortable and, and understand if they still mess things around if they move things that they shouldn't they shouldn't move but it's part of uh, being an understanding facilitator one more question and then we're wrapping up because we have to collect feedback as well uh, some slides to help guide people who to know how to use Miro or get started would be helpful if you have some tricks on how to get less tech savvy people acquainted would be great there is actually a thing um, called so the Miro Academy. I just pasted it in the, oh, sorry, I just sent it. Sorry, sir, uh, Kate, I sent it to you privately. I'm Probably so sorry. we can paste it in the board as well. Yeah, I, I, I've, I'm just gonna paste that in here near the sticky note. This link has all the things you need to get started with Miro, no matter what level you're at. Literally takes you to like the basics, getting started, uh, how to like facilitate workshops, agile workflows. So definitely check out the Miro Academy. It has a lot of, goodies in there they can definitely reference one more minute left and we have just some some uh, wrap-up items to to talk about so i'm just going to bring everyone to me in case you haven't heard the yearly miro conference is happening this year obviously between october 13 and october October 15 we have distributed 2020 it's an amazing conference fully remote obviously that you definitely need to check out Uh, make sure to click on these uh either on the blue button or on the card and check out the distributed conference uh sign up for it to get updates on speakers and who's going to be joining there so definitely check that out it's a great opportunity to uh, deepen your your knowledge and see what other people are are doing with miro so definitely take a look at the distributed 2020 uh, website and then in ending we have two uh, more interesting links that you might be interested in we have the miro online community if you click on the yellow bubble you'll be able to access it that's where we um, it's sort of a forum environment where you can ask questions. The community can answer back to you, read about all very, like various topics from design to product management to how to use Miro to everything you can think about. And then as mentioned, we have um, one VMUG every month. This month is a little special. We're going to have two of them. Um, and uh, definitely make sure to stay updated in the Miro community events website. It's also linked there. 
be really great to follow us and see what other events we're organizing. And that would be the wrap up for our session. Malud, any final words for our audience? We want to personally thank you for delivering the, the, the presentation. It was really nice. A lot of great feedback here that everyone can benefit from. So any last words before we wrap up? Thank you so much for attending and for playing with me once again. And please, if you like more of this content, follow me on social and also go to remoteforever.com and sign up for my newsletter so that you can get our newsletter every week. And also, I told you that this was just a tiny little teaser for the courses that we have. Thank you, Mulu. Thank you so much. Everyone, thank you for joining. Have an amazing rest of your week. Stay tuned to our future events and uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Have Bye. a good one. Bye-bye.